how to grow in mindfulness. Once a person came to a Sufi master Jinnah to learn meditation. He was in a hurry, so he slammed the door as he entered, took off his shoes and instead of positioning them properly in the right place, he flung the shoes that got scattered as normally happens with us. And thus he reached in front of the master. At this Jinnah asked the person to go and first apologize to the door and shoes. This baffled the person to go and seek an apology from the door and shoes. This is madness, he thought. But in front of Jannath he had no choice because Jannath refused to help him unless he sought an apology. Unwilling, he went to apologize. As he did, something happened to him. He became mindful and also felt compassion, a surge of love within. This is the first lesson in meditation, said Jannath. I have heard of another anecdote of a Zen master. A certain disciple lived in the monastery. He was learning mindfulness. One day he sought the permission of the master to go for a polo match nearby. The master permitted him for the match. When the disciple returned, the master inquired if he was tired. The disciple nodded in affirmation. Then the master inquired if the horses were tired. This question confused the disciple. Hesitatingly, he responded in affirmation. This took some time. Then the master inquired if the poles were also tired. This the disciple could not understand, so he did not answer and went to sleep. The whole night he could not sleep. He thought the master cannot be wrong. If he had asked the question, there must be a reason. With the dawn, something descended. He rushed to the hut of the master, who was waiting outside. He asked the master to repeat the question. The master repeated the question. Immediately the disciple said, Yes, indeed, the poles were also tired. When an individual attains mindfulness, insights comes to, compassion begins to flow. Such a person envisions aliveness even through the inanimate. In the journey of meditation, one cannot get insight just by intellect, study, the scriptures, hypothesis, analysis and synthesis. The student must use his or her entire being as an instrument of realization. Remember, intellect is only one part of our being. Often intellect drives us away from living reality. When the student lives around a master, Within his energy field, he begins to do things, everything mindfully. It does not matter what he does. What matters really is the key of mindfulness. Carrying the water, collecting wood for the fire, preparing food, planting lettuce, one learns mindfulness. One meditates in a sitting posture, but one learns mindfulness while carrying the water, cooking or planting. All these are not mere utilitarian actions. It is the essence of meditation. If we are not practicing mindfulness while performing such works, we are wasting our time in meditation. It will be better than to forget meditation and go on living in the world. On the contrary, when we are mindful of such minute things, we can easily attain meditation. A master observes the student in silence. 
while the student tries to bring the practice of mindfulness into each moment of life. The student may feel he is not receiving enough attention, however this way, however his ways and actions cannot escape the minute observations of the master. The master can see if the student is or is not aware. For example, the student closes the door noisily or carelessly. He is demonstrating lack of mindfulness. Closing the door gently is not in itself a virtuous act, but awareness of the fact that you are closing the door is an expression of real practice in meditation. The master does this not only for the serenity of the place, but to point out to the student that he is not practicing mindfulness. Also his actions are not majestic or subtle. It is said that in meditation there are 90,000 subtle gestures to practice. All these gestures and acts are expression of the presence of mindfulness. During my growing up years, from childhood until youth, I happened to live in the company of four masters. They happened to be my family. I come from a family of the masters of Sufi tradition. My grandfather, forefathers, uncles, aunts and grandmother were all Sufi masters. Living with a master is really living with the sword hanging over your head. A moment of slip in mindfulness, the master hits you. By hit I do not mean a literal one. Sometimes a glance, a word or a rebuke, all comes in the category of a hit. In winter, warming the water for the bath, fixing his bed, waiting for his attention to pay our regards, massaging his feet before going to bed, preparing for the bath of the master, attending to other meditators, preparing the place for meditation, cleaning, taking care of the shoes of the meditators, explanation of intricate matters and queries of the meditators, or any other work, every moment you are under the close watch of the master. A moment of slip from mindfulness can never remain unnoticed by the master. Thus living within the energy field of the master, one begins to grow in mindfulness. I assumed a human form when my grandfather, the Sufi master, created the field for my visit to this world of duality. He not only prepared the womb but also created the male energy for such birth to take place. Not only this, he nourished and nurtured the absolute consciousness in human form every finite moment until it attained maturity. Now what next is explained in the moment of awareness? I have said earlier, knowledge is not essential for mindfulness. Here I speak of conceptual knowledge. Then what are the other instruments one can use to grasp reality? One can reach the ultimate through direct experience. All studies and speculations are based on concepts. In conceptualizing, we divide reality into pieces and consider these as independent of one another. The way we conceive of things is called imagination and discriminating intellect. However, the faculty that directly experiences reality without passing through concept is called non discriminating wisdom. This wisdom is the fruit of meditation. Experience helps the student in the process.
Suppose I invite you for a cup of tea. You receive your cup of tea. You taste the tea and then drink a little more. You seem to be enjoying this. Having finished the tea, we engage in a conversation. Suppose now I ask you to describe the tea. You will use your memory, concept and your vocabulary to describe the experience of the taste. You may say the tea is very good or it is the best that I have ever tasted. You can express your experience in many other ways. However, these concepts and words often describe your direct experience. But these are not the experience itself. Indeed, in the direct experience of tea, you do not make a distinction between the subject of experience, you, and the object of experience, tea. You do not think tea is good or bad. There is no concept of word that can explain this pure experience. You can describe in as many ways as you like, but it is only you who had the direct experience of the tea. When someone listens to you, the listener can recreate certain sensations based on the experience that the listener may have had of tea. And that is all. And when you are describing the experience, you are no longer in it. In the experience, you were one with the tea. In fact, there was no distinction between the subject and the object at the moment of experience. No evaluation and no discrimination. That pure sensation is an example of non-discriminating wisdom. It is this non-discriminating wisdom that reaches the very core of reality, the ultimate reality. This is the essence of mindfulness, the very essence of meditation.